Here we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Lewanski. I am the conductor of Ensemble Del Niente. And uh, welcome to the Del Niente Fellow Travelers podcast, uh, in which we interview uh, friends and collaborators and just any person that we're interested in. Um, and uh, our guest today is uh, Ken Vandermark. And just sort of a, a personal note about Ken Vandermark. Um, so the, the um, Ken Vandermark is one of two two of the most exciting emails I've ever gotten as a member of Del Niente. The first one was uh, when um, I heard from an old friend asking if Del Niente wanted to, co to, wanted to collaborate with Deerhoof, the rock band. Um, and I was sitting in a bar and I like got that email on my phone and just about freaked out. And, and the other email that was similar to that was getting an email from Sharon Castlewitz saying that, that Ken Vandermark had agreed to play with us. That was the, those are the two big freak out moments in my <laughs> Del Niente day life. Flattered. Very flattered. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so just a little, little, just a couple of words about Ken. Um, Ken Vandermark uh, is, um, you know, I, I think I would describe him as a band leader, a readist, a composer, a writer, an Instagrammer. I'm probably leaving many other things out. Um, and But I do think like, you know, Ken, you're described, I mean, many, many musicians are described as kind of sought after or working in different genres or between genres, but I really think your work, you know, puts those descriptions to shame and puts other musicians to, to, to shame. Um, I think you've lived in Chicago since 1989. Yeah, um, that's is that right. right? That's correct. Yeah. And I think, you know, I went to your website, of course, and I clicked on like the bands area of the website and, you know, there's like 13 listed but then there's also another link for like various collaborations and inactive projects. And there's like 30 more, you know, and if you go to, if you go to the new recordings section of your website, there's 14 albums that show up. So I went to the Wikipedia discovery page, discography page, and I just started to try to count your recordings and I got to 101 and I just gave up because I was bored counting. So I, I don't know, would you have 200 recordings, something like that? I um, honestly really don't know because I don't keep track of that stuff. I mean, there's a discography there for sure, but I'm always thinking about what's in front of me. And I like to, obviously, I feel that documentation is extremely important. Um, and it comes out of a lot of different reasons. I mean, one thing I thought about early on was Herbie Nichols, an uh, incredible pianist and composer. Um, and his music is amazing. I mean, the ICP Orchestra, did a bunch of arrangements Misha Mengelberg made of his music. Um, he was somewhat of a contemporary with Thelonious Monks. There's some parallels in the way the music sounds and works. He's very, very incredible, inventive uh, composer and an amazing pianist. And there's only, I think, three albums of his music. And there's wow. no recordings of him playing with horns. You know. Wild. He's connected to the jazz music history, let's say. And he played with horn players. He played with people like Roswell Rudd and, and others. And I always thought about that. It's like, here's this person, his work is amazing. There's almost no documentation, like three records in an entire career. Um, and there's no example of how he comped behind horn players. Like we only have him as a leader soloing or playing the pieces. And that's gone. Like yeah. the players that worked with him could describe that, but there's no documentation. And early, once it was possible to start recording, I just wanted to run with it. And basically what my approach to recording is to document ongoing projects on like relatively speaking around every year. Uh, so certain groups, like I have a duo with Paul Nelson Love that works with completely improvised music. And we have a lot of records in, a, in our discography, but we've been playing together for 20 years. Yeah. And the music always changes. You know, it's always evolving, shifting. And I like the music a lot. I think documenting that pro progression uh, is warranted, so I do it. And because, as you mentioned, I work with lots of different musicians, lots of different bands, the recordings tend to accumulate. Um, it's a different situation. Uh, if I think of an artist like Miles Davis, the trajectory of his career, which was extraordinary, is like, let's say, in a kind of like a line, so to simplify, and, and he's documenting those groups as they go. Um, I'm working, and I'm not trying to suggest that I'm on par with Miles Davis, but I'm just using that as an example of like artistic uh, development, let's say. 
I'm working with a half dozen parallel sets of activity that all have their arc, their linear progression, let's say. And so the, the thing that happens is that there's more material uh, to document, and, I, and I'm passionate about that. So I think that if you listen to the development of each of those lines, you'll see what's being uh, illustrated through the recordings. Mm -hmm. If you look at everything all at once and you, you count the numbers, it, it becomes a different sort of perspective on the process. And so I'm trying to uh, document a, a very interwoven collaborative process that involves many, many people. And I'm part of that, but I think if you listen to the recordings, there's so much difference between them, even in the, in the progression of one group um, and between the different lines of parallel activity. So there, there's a lot of recordings because there's a lot of work, you know, I guess yeah. that's the way to put it. Well, that, I mean, that's really interesting. You know, I, I, um, maybe I just will have a follow up question about that, which is, or, or maybe a, a comment and you can respond to my comment, which is that, uh, yeah, that is an interesting, um, that the, the Miles Davis comparison is really, uh, instructive and interesting. And, you know, I was thinking also this morning, I was going to ask you about this. So let's just, let's just do it. Um, yeah, it, like, you know, the Miles Davis records, it does feel like, you know, um, that they feel often like their compositions, you know, the album is some sort of like feels unified or feels like a representation of, mm -hmm. of the, him, him working in a particular era, you know, and, um, I've been thinking a lot recently about um, the philosopher, philosopher Lydia Gurr has this notion of the work concept where she thinks at the beginning of the 18th century, people really started thinking about works as being the primary driving force of music, you know, it, rather than genre or performer or something like that. So, and, um, I, and I think it's interesting, you, you, you're talking about sort of rather than like, it sounds to me like you're, you're not talking about capturing a work as it's composed, but rather a kind of fluid, um, a, a fluid series of, you know, stepping forward and stepping back and a fluid set of developments of different projects that aren't necessarily, um, that can't be sort of categorized as a work or an album. Um, yeah, it's a process. It's, it's a documentation of a process. And, you know, everybody who works in my field, anybody who works creatively in any field, I think uh, the, let's say the objects in the case of a recording in, in music or a painting or a, a, a collection of poetry, a film, those are documents of a process. They're part of a process. They're the, the not the end result though. You know, they're, they're, if you look at, like I'm a huge fan of Godard. And, and if you look at his series of films that he's still making now, hopefully, uh, the, fil the films, you know, sometimes they're called masterpieces or whatnot, but it's a whole thing. They're all like signposts on this series of, of, of events that's a creative process that's gone through his entire life. And the recordings for me are that too. They're, they're not, they're not to use the term you're citing, they're not works and they're like, that's the end game, sure. you know? And I'm, I work as an improviser and that definitely is a process. And so having the documents, it's kind of like, uh, what do you say? It's like a, a postcard. <laughs> huh. like, you know, it's, it's like a thing that indicates what was happening at that point in time with this particular group of people, but it's not the ultimate version of that. Yeah. Ideally, it's a strong version. Otherwise, I wouldn't release the record. But it needs, from my point of view, it needs to be, the perspective needs to, to see it as an ongoing set of activities. And these are, are parts of the documentation of that activity. But to really know what a band's doing, you'd have to see them over and over again over the course of time from night to night. Because if we're doing our job and we're really improvising, things change. And there is no masterpiece. They're just good examples of the work. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's great. I love, I love that idea of the postcard, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that it reminds me there's a, um, a composer, Aaron Einbond, who has a series of pieces that he calls, he's, he calls sonic postcards. And what he literally did is he literally uh, has a recorder, a field recorder, and he goes to a place and records just the ambient sound that's happening that day. And then he actually transcribes it for ensemble. So oh. it's this weird kind of complex relationship between 
a totally spontaneous thing happening in the world and like then a thing that an ensemble kind of reproduces. Wow, that's interesting. But, yeah, but I, I think, I mean, and I'm also, you know, you're, and you're talking about improvisation and um, it, it, it sounds to me like sort of what you're saying is that, you know, there's of course the improvisation that happens in, in real time, you know, during the concert, during the show, but also maybe the, um, the accumulated series of recordings over 20 years or something like that. Um, between you and, and Paul Nielsen Love, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, mm -hmm. yeah. um, P A A L. I was like, I don't know. I was like, no. My Norwegian is not great. That's what I say. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> some years I've been doing it wrong. That it's that's what it is. Yeah, but I mean, it's almost like that accumulated series of recordings is itself some sort of like long scale improvisation or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it it is how do I put it. It's a conversation that keeps going, you know, as long as it, it, it's rewarding to the both of us. I mean, we did a tour in Japan in December and played 16 shows in like, I don't know, 22 days or something. It was amazing. And the whole time the music kept changing and evolving, you know, and, and so it, in a sense, like the recordings are, are, yeah, chapters, like a moment in time over a thing that's still going, you know, it's still, still active. And, and I think, as a fan of music, you know, to use the Herbie Nipple, Nichols example again, I mean, I wish there were more recordings. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I couldn't be there. I couldn't hear him live and play. You know, I didn't get to see those things. And, you know, um, the fact that there are just these three documents that are so amazing. Um, as a fan, I wish that there were like 30 you know, uh, to, to hear the variety of what he did and over time, because they were recorded very, you know, in a short period of time as well. And when you hear someone like one of my heroes in music is Derek Bailey, and you listen to the recordings from the beginning to the end and, and you know, the, the diversity there, if he had only made three recordings, you wouldn't know anything about Derek Bailey, really. So, like, I feel like, okay, I have not indication of what Herbie Nichols was about artistically, but in the, but in the reality, I don't really know, you know? And, and so, so I, I think about those things and I think about, about uh, the rationale behind doing the records because understandable, understandably people, um, you know, can be critical of that. It's like, do we need another record with you and Paul? And my response to just use that example. Mm -hmm. And my response to that is, well, I think so because, yeah. If for me the mu the 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 music keeps changing, it's fascinating, and this is part of the process. And here we're in a different place now. And like in Japan, we played all these concerts, and like five of them we collaborated with musicians from Japan, you know. And that changed what we did, you know, playing. And so that whole thing, like we have these recordings, and actually while you know we're we're quarantined, self quarantined quarantining and whatnot you know he's in his hometown in Norway and Stavania and I'm in Chicago and we're going to be working on these recordings now because that's something you can do and kind of go through them and figure out how to, to work on them and, and release them and that just that one series of concerts at that time in December is a whole set of chapters about creative work that we're doing both in collaboration with other people with the scene that's there, with the musicians that are there, um, and between our ongoing conversation that's been going on for a couple decades. So I, I think, you know, I, I guess in a sense it can be considered egocentric to, to think that, oh, it, it's warranted, but that's what a painter does. You know, I mean, they're supposed to do one painting a year. I mean, right. some, some people work that way and that's the way they work, that's their method. But I, I kind of look at the recordings as, as uh, I don't know, as paintings. You know, if I was a painter, this, the painting isn't the thing. The painting is an indicator of a process. You know, I love De Kooning. I love looking at his, as, at his creative arc, all the changes and his ongoing push. And if he just made a couple paintings, masterpieces, then you miss all the detail between it. There's so much less understanding there about his artistic search and path and i kind of feel like i'm trying to do the same thing and i try to make sure that they're as strong as possible otherwise they don't believe it or not there are a lot of records that don't come out 
<laughs> I, I, I believe that. I mean, you know, as a musician myself, I, th- I, I, I know. I, I definitely have given performances where I'm like, oh, I hope no one's recording that one. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I, I really like this. I like this painting analogy. I mean, I, and I think I totally agree with you. I don't think that there's any reason. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it doesn't seem even 1% egotistic or anything like that. But I, I mean, the, the painting analogy is interesting because you think of like some of those impressionist painters that or post-impressionist painters that painted the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the series of haystacks in the Art Institute of Chicago and it's like the haystack in the evening and the haystack in the morning and the haystack in winter and summer. And, and it's like, you know, n- no one's accusing Monet of being egotistical for painting the same thing. It's, you know, it, what is inherently interesting is that, is that it's like, coming back to the same material and looking at it in a different way. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think like, but I do think that's it. I think it works for, and it's, it's also, I think um, as a classical musician, I think it's also, I find that a refreshing way of approaching recordings um, and just, and it's a different way of thinking about work because, you know, in the classical world, you know, there's often like a, there's this focus on like getting the recording perfect, you know, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't even sound like you're like perfection is not like, a criterion and it doesn't enter into the equation even probably um, I mean stuff is better and worse but it doesn't sound like you're interested in yeah, like, I mean, I, achieving I, I a per also, product yeah it, this, uh, how do I, like it, it's tied to the kind of music I like mm-hmm. um, you know as as I mentioned you know it's like I'm as much a music fan as a, as a performer and I have a very large record collection and I spend a lot of time listening to music when I'm at home and on tour and the music that I gravitate to most is music that has a raw characteristic to it, that it's not perfected, you know. And, and, and there's popular music, like I love Sly Stone. And, you know, you could say that music is pretty perfected, and I would agree with you, but there's so much edge in it still. Like if you listen to uh, the record Fresh and the way he's singing on that, and he's on a lot of drugs and he's a mess and and you i in some of it like if you want me to stay or or whatnot you listen to that piece and the way he's singing the performance is almost impossible because you can almost picture him hardly able to be in the chair or stand i mean he's falling apart on some level but the result of that is so extraordinary and powerful and I'm not advocating drug use. That's not the point here at all. But it's here's a pop music artist, whatever term we might use. I think he's a genius. And even in that music that is kind of perfected, so to speak, there's this characteristic of something on the edge of, of possibility, mm-hmm. a roughness in the car- is the way his voice sounds. And, and I, you know, I, I, all the music I like has that, like, I love post-punk. I love this period, you know, of, of bands, particularly coming out of England or in the U S in the eighties, where like you have bands like the Minutemen and, and whatnot, where they're inventing it's rock music, but they're also inventing all new forms and ways of dissecting it and breaking it apart and constructing and deconstructing. And it's like, you feel the moment of invention. Mm. And to use the Sly Stone thing, even though that's studio music, uh, if you compare it to the live music, there's this edge of invention happening. Like they're just, he's discovering a new thing. The records, the recordings keep changing. The process keeps changing. And you're hearing, again, these documents of this process and the changes. They're not, the first record does not sound like the last record. Um, And so for the music that I'm making, um, you know, like the band Marker that I work with, it's all based uh, Chicago musicians and all of them are like half my age. Uh, We do things differently, but I feel it's a really strong collaboration. Um, When we record, you know, uh, we tour, work on the music, go in the studio and both records we've made, everything is essentially a first take. Wow. Um, and you know, the first time we did that, my impression from the other musicians were they were a little bit freaked out about it. Like, you know, oh, that's it is, yeah, that's it. Cause the feelings there, you know, like if you do a bad take or something's wrong, okay, that's, you know, like there's a couple pieces we re- redid part of it or something, but basically on both of those records, all the music is, is first takes. And after doing this for a long time, like when I first started working with the Vandermark Five, the first records, we'd have like 
time in the studio and we'd get the things finished and we'd, oh, let's do another version of that. You know, why not? And we'd have like maybe two versions, three versions of some of the pieces. And literally every single time it was the first take, <laughs> the best take. And there might be flaws in it. Like, you know, the head might, you know, part of the piece might not be executed perfectly, but there was an energy and an invention there that got captured. And that's what I'm looking for in, in the work I'm doing. So like the idea of the perfect version. Okay, there's written material in a lot of the music I, I, I work with. Um, and it balances and interacts with the impro improvised material. And that balancing act, like you can work on the head and like maybe play it better and play it better. But if you're coming out of that or moving towards it with improvisation, and you know, it's not like night to night you're playing the piece again. It's like back to back, back to back, or, or within that day, trying to tackle this material and uh, that's composed and how it should impact your improvisation. And you're supposed to like, what, reinvent it from zero again? Yeah. That's very, very, very hard to do, at right, least for right, me, right. to have that freshness, the immediacy, the immediate idea. Then you've done a version and then you're, okay, well, let's do another take because we didn't quite nail this part. Well, I don't care about nailing that part. What I care about is the way the improvising works with the parts that are right. composed. And if we get the things, the piece comes across, the character of the piece, the nature of the piece, I don't really care so much if there's a flaw somehow. It's the, co the combination, the impact of the combination and the realization of the intention and the character of the material. It, and almost always that happens in a first take. So if you're prepared, like we, we are with the people I work with, we work on the music, we practice the music, we do rehearsals with the music. And then it's like you get all that preparation and you let go of the page, you know, in a sense. It's not about the page, it's about music. And music mm -hmm. is in the performance, in the interpretation of the material, in the improvising that goes connected with the material. And the same thing is, is true with completely improvised material. Mm. You know, uh, it's, it's like you can do takes after takes after takes of like open improvisation, but the human mind has a, a limit to generating uh, fresh material. You mm. know, at some point there's diminished returns, you know, and you have to live with the mistakes, but I'd rather live with a mistake and have an, a strong performance and realization of a, of a piece of music if we're using compositional materials. Um, and have that realization of this is what this is about, as opposed to like, ah, oh, well, you know, this is a little bit sloppy. And, and I go back to the music I like. You know, it's like, you know, you hear Motown tunes and there's like mistakes. Yeah. And like, who cares? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm sure the musicians were like, damn, you know, ah, uh, you could like after the take, but, yeah. like, but you know, the, 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 the big picture is that somehow like on those great tunes, you know, it's like, how do they even pull this off? It's so organically amazing. And, and the bass doesn't come in right somewhere, but who cares? Because yeah. the right. energy of the thing is, is captured. And that's why we can keep listening to that music over and over again. Not because it's perfect. It's perfect on another level of perfection. You know, it's right. creative right. perfection as opposed to like being a mechanic, you know, and, and, and putting all the parts in the right order, you know? There's, there's another element to music, to art, that isn't about uh, craftsmanship on that execution level. All that's important for sure. And I don't mean to denigrate mechanics because I can't even drive a car. <laughs> but I, I feel like there's like, what we're, what we're striving for is the, is, the, is the the other level. Like, you know, it's like a Steve Lacey quote that he got from Thelonious Monk, you know, lifting the bandstand. There's, it's more than just doing it right. It's taking it to someplace, you know, bringing it someplace. And, and you got to let go to do that. You can't get too caught up in the details. Um, you know, and that's why you need to know the details uh, uh, and have them together so you can let them go. You know, it's a process like that. Right. I, I like that. You have to know the details so you can let them go. Yeah, this kind of, it reminds me of like in... Um... You know, I think in like classical music recording land, there's kind of like, there's often a tension between like studio recordings, you know, highly perf perfected and like, and, uh, and live recordings. And it's interesting to me that like, yeah, live recordings of some certain kinds of pieces are really like these kind of almost like fetishized objects because like, it, it, as you're saying, it's like, it's astonishing that a record exists of this particular moment in time. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of like there, there's this performance of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony that 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 Furtwängler did 
with the Vienna Philharmonic in 1942 in Germany during World War II. Wow. And, and it's just like, it's this, you know, it's kind of out of tune and whatever, you know, but it's like this hair raising, like terrifying thing where like the orchestra almost like goes off the rails at the end if it's, if, as if it's protesting Hitler's birthday. It's just like, it's a crazy document. There's no other performance like it. And right, as you're saying, you couldn't possibly, you know, capture that energy except in that moment, in that place. Mm -hmm. And like no studio recording will, 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 will achieve that level of intensity and terror, you know, say. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's also like a completely different thing. I mean, I'm connected, like it, it, I use the studio, almost always the studio for me is a way, is like documentary, you know? Yeah. It's like it, it try, it's like capturing what we do in concert a live performance in front of an audience in a studio environment, which often helps uh, clarify the sound and things like this. And there's certain things you can do in the studio, especially now with everything digitized where you can fix a mistake pretty easily and, you know, whatever. So you, you get some things that maybe are, are improved uh, on some level, you know, technical level, let's say. But the live recordings too, I mean, a lot of the things I put out are, are from performances, um, in front of an audience and you know it, they're very different i mean I, you, you know this for sure i mean they're very different experiences as a performer and those differences impact the kind of work that results and you know i like to like when you mentioned live recordings of, of music on you know, classical music it's so i'm a big fan of glenn gould and one of the uh, um, uh, uh, goldberg variations is a live one um, from salzburg mm. And I love that recording and there's mistakes in it. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because <laughs> there's something else happening. And it's like, you can feel like, like it's so such a magical performance and totally different. Like that's a, that's a huge part of Ghoul that I love is like when you hear these versions of the Goldberg variations, it's like almost like, I mean, I, what I'd understand about his process and working on the pieces, he dealt with all kinds of relationships within the composition that altered the way he performed it. But honestly, especially the Salzburg thing, it really feels like he's an improviser. It really feels like he's, the music is like happening in that moment, not as a, as a performance that's been kind of perfected and taken to another level. It's like he's hearing it that way at that time and this is how it has to be played. And that's complete conjecture and, and whatnot on my part, but it really feels that way which is maybe why I, I like his, his performances so much that I connect with him on that level. But in the Salzburg performance, it's like you, you, I keep realizing there are people in that room hearing this. Yeah. Like that presence, even though they're quiet, you right. know, every once in a while you'll hear a sound, but it's like there is a weight there, mm -hmm. a, a presence, a, 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 an energy of like, it almost brings you to the performance as a listener on the recording, like you're participating in this, like, holy, I mean, wow. Yeah. Listen to what is happening here. Yeah. This is extraordinary. And that's, you know, you can't really do that in the studio. You can right. do something different in the studio and it has its purposes and that's why I use it. Um, but there are all these variables in there towards making music. And, you know, I like, since we're talking about recordings a lot, I, I just would like to say that for me, the main thing is, live music despite the fact that i have a lot of recordings out a lot of documentation the whole thing is about performing in a concert situation in front of an audience and finding out what's happening at that time uh, in performance and the and the, the recordings are important to me it's documentation but the thing right now with not being able to play concerts in a conventional sense and how long this will probably go, that is killing me. Yeah. Because it's not, I mean, yeah, economics are involved and whatnot, but like, you know, the project that we were gonna work on together. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was so looking forward to that and, and working together and meeting the other musicians and playing with them. And, and that, that just, you know, hopefully we're gonna be able to do it next year and yeah. then we'll figure that out we'll figure it out but like but like just right now to be kind of like i mean i spent half a year on the road this is the longest i've been home i, I can't even remember how long i've been that i've been home this long i mean it's been decades 
And so like to, to always be moving and like nomadic and, and traveling and, and all the work and the collaborations and meeting people and working with friends, all of that activity, which inspires me and creates the energy to do the next thing, the next thing and always be moving to suddenly literally overnight hit a, yeah. hit a wall and all of the world falls out and like try to think of like, Oh man, I mean like, it's it's those things that that performance thing that is the hardest thing to contend with and luckily you know uh all the people i know working in the ways that we do are finding solutions to do what we can do now and that's been very inspiring and super exciting but i would lie to say i am missing the the work the the engaged work with other musicians, um, I'm missing it like hell because, yeah. you know, most of like, like if you say a painter, a writer, you know, there's certain people who work, you know, as in a solitary pursuit, surely they're social and everything, but their work itself is them facing the page, facing the canvas, so to speak. Um, but other kinds of arts are very collaborative and music is one of them. And yeah, I do solo music and a lot of musicians I know do solo music. But most of what I do is working with other people and to lose that synergy for months and months, man, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to be able to do this because, you know, having conversations like this with friends or like, you know, in a, in a discussion like this, that that's very useful, very helpful. And it's kind of keeping my head together, but um, it's, it's going to be like, you know, take it a day at a time because I've never, no one's been in this position. This is like a totally new landscape. And I find it very inspiring and fascinating to see how so many people I know are finding solutions right now to keep the work going forward somehow, to keep things happening, to, to generating different ways of working and keeping creative. And that's, that's, that's been amazing, really amazing. Yeah, I, that's, um, you know, uh, I, I've been having, I mean, not surprisingly, I've been having similar feelings about like, you know, of course, I've always been like live music is the best thing, but now I'm really like, I was we, we were right. Live music yeah. is the best thing. We're just we're missing it. And uh, and I, I've honestly, you know, I, I, I'm 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 glad that people in my field are being courageous because you know, I mean, you know, freelancers in the classical field, I mean, all their gigs were canceled and they don't have any income until they can, you know. So it's so I really admire. I'm 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 lucky to have a job. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel very privileged, and I'm I'm but I'm glad. I admire my colleagues for being so courageous, but to be honest, I've had a hard time watching online concerts because when I watch an online concert, I'm immediately like, Oh my God, I miss concerts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. It's really tough. I mean, I, uh, last week I did, um, experimental sound studio has been mm, doing sure. quarantine concerts, which I mean, ESS has been amazing forever. I mean, they're oh, yeah. incredible. And, and the people working there now are, are brilliant and amazing amazing people to know and amazing to work people, with. Yeah. Um, and, and a perfect example is the series of concerts, the quarantine uh, series is um, incredible in the way they got it off the ground almost immediately. They've raised $14,000 for musicians already through this program. Uh, so many people are meeting each other and connecting through the process. They're meeting new curators. It's like in a terrible situation. Yeah. This is like the ultimate approach because something really positive and long-term positive is happening through this activity that they've created. And I, I am like you, it's been, it's been really hard. I mean, the, the online engagement, it, it's, it's like you can't replace a, a real concert experience. And so people are trying to find new things to do, different things to do. And I'm a thousand percent supportive of all of it, but speaking personally, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, uh, to not long for the experience of engagement that comes in a concert situation or performance situation in a, in a more conventional sense. That said, I have to admit when I did uh, the Sequester Fest uh, uh, concert, uh, the Corbett versus Dempsey gallery organized mm -hmm. with the quarantine uh, series that ESS does, um, I wanted to do it for sure and was looking forward to it. Um, but I have to say that when I sat down and watched the performances before and after me on that uh, concert, 
and saw the platform that ESS had come up with using the Twitch format, which gamers use, it create, they have a, a, there's an ongoing chat that happens. And at first I was like, oh, this is kind of jive. I mean, you know, because I can be pretty cynical about things. Uh, but I have to say very quickly, though it do, did not replace a real concert experience in a conventional sense, it was the first thing I had seen or experienced of this online circumstance that we're in trying to figure out how to do performances, where the social engagement, which is so crucial to a performance, the social engagement between the musicians working together, the energy from the audience, talking to the audience before and after, the engagement of the audience with themselves, all of that stuff, this is the first thing I had experienced where aspects of that were part of the process. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, there people are chatting with each other while the performance is going on. And yes, normally in a, con <laughs> in a concert, you're not going to want to have people talking to each other during the music. <laughs> but in this context, it was amazing to watch because like, you know, I, I remember watching Joe McBee's performance and, you know, you're seeing people, all right, man, the last time I saw Joe was in such and such a date. So I was mm -hmm. at that gig, gig too. And, you know, then they, they're talking to a friend that they haven't seen in weeks that, or, you know, someone across the uh, country that they, they know and, and all these things. And it's like engaged, really engaged and connected to the music and commenting on the music. And, and, and I was like shocked by this, that it was actually not like super simplistic and, and, and dumb. It was, it was really connected. And so when I did my set, even though I was in my living room playing at my phone, I could completely feel the people there listening. Wow. It wasn't like an isolated experience. Like, okay, I know this is going out into the ether and I'm hoping someone's catching it. I just experienced like two hours of watching people engage with the music, with each other. And yeah, it's totally different than a normal concert, but it created that synergy of a social aspect of music, which is so important to me. And I think musicians everywhere. And that made the performance part work too mm, okay. where i felt like okay they're there i'm playing for these people and i had just seen how important it was to them yeah. to hear someone like joe mcphee or or claire or you know i mean all all these these people um claire chase i mean you know all of these people performing and 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 listeners starving to hear live music and how important it was that this was taking place and that ess was running these these concerts, and they were people like, I've seen every one of these. I tune in every night. I have dinner and watch these and listen. And it's like, you know, wow, like this is so positive and a real alternative under these conditions. And so like to what you said, I, I feel it. I feel exactly how you feel. And I'm excited by this, this, uh, this, this thing that, that ESS has developed using a platform that exists. And I think other people will start doing it too more often because that social part, I think that's what I'm missing, you know, normally. And, th and this creates that. It was super powerful. That's a, I mean, thank you so much for telling me that. I, I have, I have not yet seen any of, I love ESS. I mean, what a, an amazing organization. And I haven't yet seen any of the quarantine concerts. Well, check it out and see what you think because it, give, I, yeah. I, it, it creates that kind of energy that I think we're both missing in a conventional performance in these circumstances. And everyone's trying to do the best they can and figure it out. But I was very impressed by uh, the engagement from from this uh, this platform. Yeah, I've, I've been waiting to figure out, you know, um, right? Exactly, like, uh, I've been waiting to figure out who's going to do the thing in this particular circumstance that doesn't just feel like a poor substitute for a concert, right. but rather some way of taking advantage of the situation. And actually, like the, the sort of social aspect that you're talking about, people chatting that wouldn't actually other. I mean, of course, if you're if you're at a concert, you're not going to be like, oh, hey, nice to see you you know, like you're going to listen to the music. So that, that's a really the idea of the audience having an important role in the music, but a different role mm -hmm. that that's the, the, you're, you're the first person that's made that has like uh, suggested actually a way of using this positively rather than just a poor substitute. So thank you. Yeah. I'm going to check out these concerts. I mean, yeah, I, I, I you should, I, I think you'll, you know, it, that's the thing. That's the thing is like, we, we can't look for a replacement for a thing that's only <laughs> possible in a live context with people right. room together. Right. There's, a ritual, there's a ritualistic aspect to music that goes back to pre-language probably, you know? And 
you cannot replace that under these conditions. You know, you can do a Zoom conversation, uh, let's say a concert, have a bunch of people playing at the same time, maybe, maybe some way that can work, maybe this, maybe that. But there's no way you're going to replace that real experience of everybody in that room together experiencing the sound taking place in real time. That said, solutions are going to have to happen because we're going to go nuts. We're going to have to have live music somehow. And we're right at the front end of this thing. And already, uh, using ESS and the quarantine conscious as an example, there's some really interesting solutions happening that don't replace the thing itself, but create an alternative that provides a real experience under these conditions that uh, connects socially as well as like musically within the limitations that exist. So it's like a, a, the part of what made it successful was the realization, oh, this isn't trying to be a concert. Right. Like in the conventional sense. This is what this is. Right. And this is right. people talking to each other in real time while the music's happening. Some just listening and watching purely. Others having a conversation about a show they saw some other time. Or like just saying, hey, Joe, amazing, or whatever it might be. But that's a different thing. You know, and, and it's, it's its own thing. It's its own viable thing that we have right now. One example, and I'm sure people are going to come up with other things that may be even better. And, and that's the fact that it's already happening so quick is like a, a, a testament to the greater resilience of people right now. It's amazing what people are doing. Now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to thank you for this. Um, <laughs> I, I want to, um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I am interested in, so, I mean, I have a lot of sort of questions for you about community, just in lots of, in lots of different kinds of senses. Um, I think maybe to, uh, to pivot slightly a community related question, but like a slightly different thing that I meant, would be curious to get your, your take on is that, you know, so I noticed that, um, you know, I, I noticed that the, the, the field that you work in, which I don't know, I mean, I have free jazz, experimental, experimental jazz, free improvisation, um, avant-garde jazz, any number of labels that don't quite fit. Um, you know, of course, has a very has a community that follows it really closely, and of course, like the field that I mostly work in, uh, kind of you want new music, contemporary music, experimental music, you know, um, or the word creative music ends up in various places. You know, m my field also has very specific, you know, strong followers and a strong community. Um, and you know, I think that, that's interested me about these two musics. You know, your field and and my field is that like it seems to me like they actually have like a lot in common, mm -hmm. um, both, both in terms of like, you know, sometimes just the sonic result. Like I saw, mm -hmm. I saw you play with like Macy Stewart and, um, and what's her name? The percussionist. Oh, Claire yeah. Claire Ray. Ray. And, um, I saw y'all play last summer and, you know, it just struck me that like so much of what you played would just be right at home on a Del Niente concert. You mm -hmm. literally just could have put your performance on a Del Niente concert and people would have been like, yeah, legit. It's a Del Niente concert, you know? And, um, so I, I am curious. So on the one hand, and also like both of these fields kind of experiment with form and they experiment with timbre and they experiment with like harmony and all kinds of, um, you know, and they're really like transgressive fields in a certain way. And, and I, I noticed, however, that like, it seems, it seems to me, and you tell me if you don't accept the premise of this question, that these communities, you know, are mostly separate. And I think they're interacting more than they used to, which I think is, I hope is good. But I wonder if you think they're s separate why you think that is and do you think that's a good thing or a neutral thing or do you not accept the premise of my question any of the above uh, no I, I i do feel all the things you're saying to be honest i mean uh from the standpoint of like let's say the music itself definitely the fields uh you know let's say the improvised music field and the new music field just to use yeah those sure. monitors uh there's a lot of overlap uh aesthetically right now you know and, and there has been for a, a while but lit, i i love uh, new music composers and i've been fortunate to meet a few people who have helped key me into like com contemporary composers um uh the claim form being the uh, uh, anders nyquist the trumpet player i got to work with him on a project led by Matt Gustafson a couple of years ago and you know he he gave me a list of composers and i it's hard to find i mean if you are in that field and and researching that field directly, certainly you're going to get the information right. about the, but to, to go to a musician who works in that field and get feedback from them and get a list of people to check out was 
very, very helpful for me and huge. And definitely the range of uh, composers that they've been working with and hearing some of the recordings that they put out. Um, the I, You mentioned form and, you know, Tomber, the things have moved and the different composers are working with form in very, 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 very different ways. And so right now, you know, you have someone like uh, Eliane Radig on one end of the spectrum and then, um, you know, Lachenman on another end of the spectrum. And those, there are older composers and there's a lot of younger composers in the mix of that dealing with all, but the, the point is that there's a huge range of activity that's under the umbrella of new music now and is right. accepted as like viable ways to work. You know, like the idea that serialism, you know, going back to the fifties or whatever is like the end game on this. Well, that's quite clear that it's not. There's like a lot of other ways to go. Yeah. The same thing is true in my field where people, you know, a lot of what the, the aesthetic basis is, is about pushing the envelope on extended techniques, different kinds of uh, construction, whether the music's completely improvised or it works with, uh, with composition. Most of the composers that I'm excited about are peers of mine that are dealing with form, the questions of form, how do you organize music with composing, integrating improvisation, what's the balance on that, what are the shapes of the pieces, let's get away from the basic shapes, how do we do that, why do basic shapes work, you know, all these questions, they're, they're asking those questions too. And all that really does overlap in terms of aesthetics between these, let's say, two different kinds of fields. Um, the weird thing is that because there are these parallels, even though there are differences in the way things get made, that most of the new music stuff is, let's say, to simplify, tends towards through composition on one sure. level. Or, it tends or, to be notated for sure. Yeah, you know, and... and, tends and, and to be. Tends to be, all right. And even if it's not, you know, there are pieces where like there's specific guidelines to what activity has to take place in a certain time, whatever. Whereas like with improvised stuff, even if there's a written piece, like that can be bent in many different ways, hopefully, if it's good. And so there's like differences there for sure. But the overlap in the audience doesn't take place as much as you would think just from the surface of like what you're hearing. If you're excited about Helmut Lachman, let's just use that example. Um, well then wouldn't you be excited about, you know, Derek Bailey and Evan Parker and Tony Oxley flying? Like why not? Cause there's like elements there that are concurrent, you know? But I think part of the issue is that the musicians don't collaborate enough. It comes from the source. So if you see improvisers, you know, that was what was so exciting about the Dalmiente project yeah. was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm known for being part of this Chicago, uh, aspect of the Chicago music scene. You guys are known for this part. And okay, we're going we're gonna to be in the room together. What's going to be the end result? It's going to be different than you working on your own and me working on my own. And that's exciting. Right. The cross-pollination process is essential to me uh, and for me. There's no question about it. But that kind of collaboration, considering the overlap in aesthetics, doesn't happen as much as you would think from a from just like a logical common sense basis. I think it's happening more now. Like uh, you know, some of the younger players I'm I'm working with, you know, on the scene here, you see a lot more. Um, you know, like like uh, uh, Ryan pa Packard is Ryan like Packard, playing yeah. new music circles and improvising yep. circles, and he goes between them all the time. You know, um, uh, you got like people like Katink Klein. Yeah. You know work in, in new music circles and also diving in with improvisers and, and it's amazing at, at both. So you, there are these things happening and the more they happen, the more that audience I think is also gonna overlap because they're seeing it from the source, they're seeing it from the musicians themselves. It's making sense to the musicians, so they're gonna start asking the question, well, why? Yeah, you know, I wanna see that collaborative performance. Like for example, our project together, people who follow my music and don't know anything about Dalmiente probably would have gone to those shows. Right. And vice versa. Vice versa, exactly. You no, know, total, and then then everybody benefits from that. Yeah, the musicians do from like a new project, a new way of working, new mm -hmm. ideas come out of that. Uh, the audience sees things differently. Presenters see things differently. It's the you know writers, the journalists following us. It opens up everything. And when I first moved to Chicago, uh, you know, in, in during the early '90s and whatnot, a lot of this was happening in mm -hmm. lots of parts of the music scene here you know if people noise musicians were working with improvisers the rock scene was playing with improvisers so like you know i, I was working with dennis and kimball trio 
and Dwayne Dennison and, and for a while Jim Kimmel too were you know in uh, in Jesus Lizard, which was like very much an intense rock band, and they wanted to work with me because I was playing with the Vandermark Quartet, and they saw a relationship there. A band like Tortoise, which is one of the more high-profile groups coming out of the city, you know, to overly simplify maybe a little bit is like a great example of cross-pollination because right. members of that band completely came out of the improvised music, quote-unquote jazz scene, new jazz scene here, and combined with the underground rock scene that was happening. And the end result was this band that everybody who follows music knows about now. So like the benefits of cross-pollination uh, are completely obvious to me. And basically that's been my, my goal and process since that time is to be in those environments as much as possible. So like, you know, working with the band X out of Holland and the projects they did, they're another great example. All the music they did with Gitachi Mercuria and the Ethiopian musicians that they work with still. I mean, that's a great example. Like what they made is both Ethiopian and X. And it's something completely different that would not have happened. It's mm -hmm. not like a dumbing down of either. And that's the thing about great great collaboration is it raises everything up. It doesn't flatten it out. And when you get into those uh, situations, you can feel things changing right away. And, and that's, that's what, uh, what I wanna, wanna see happen. And, and to your original question about like, well, why are these things maybe more apart than they should be? I think that that's where it comes from. The, the collaborations have gotta be generated out of the people making the work right. and then the rest will follow because it has to. It has to be that way. And, and you know, you get into like, you know, to be upfront about it, um, there's institutionalized funding that in general, I mean, there, I'm not saying always, but in general is geared towards more money towards new music circles yep. Yep. than improvised music circles. Absolutely. And this goes back, there's like, a, there's like a whole lot of reasons for this and there's not enough time and, and like, yeah, it, it's very complex. But there's a lot of history there that separates these from the standpoint of artistic uh, reception. Right. You know, if you have a score and you can make the argument for this piece of paper, um, the truth is, if I'm an improviser, and to use the, exa the example of playing with Macy Stewart and, and Claire Rousset, and you, you, I didn't bring it up. You, you mentioned like, wow, this would fit mm -hmm. on a Dal Niente program, right? Right. We let's say we agree on that for sure. Mm -hmm. For me to get funding for that trio would be is way harder, even though the results are in the same aesthetic right. world. Then I'm, I'm sure Dal Niente has uh, for your grant applications and, and funding. And I'm not, I mean, you guys should get the money. I mean, that's not, <laughs> that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be really beneficial to everybody in terms of opening up these doors. Because the, the attitude towards improvisers, oh, you guys make it up. Like, I've had new music people say that to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, you know, telling people in the audience. Like, I, I did a performance years ago with some new music people on the bill. And... I played and they played and when they got on they said yeah you know that was very impressive but we have to play what's written on the page we have to we have to be able to execute this and denigrated what I work on yeah you know and that's pretty screwed up because yep. there's room for all of this so when when you have funding issues that sort of indicate well this is the serious music mm -hmm. and these are people playing over here you know where's yeah. the truth in that and I know you know this the work that, that people in my field do and the work that you do has different aspects, but there's just as much rigor and discipline involved. It, it's applied in different kinds of ways at times, but for me to do what I do on my instruments is akin to what you guys have to do on yours. You know, and, and, and there's, so there's lots of overlap, and there's a lot of reasons why there's a separation there that's actually artificial, mm. you know, because aesthetically right. it coexists. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think like the, 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 the exciting thing is this idea of, you know, this, you guys inviting me to work with you and then, then you see what happens. You know, that's those are the bridges that need to happen and be generated out of the, out of the performers and, and the, the creative people making the work, the initial thing itself. And then and then the reverberations happen. People come and say, wow, this is exciting. I mean, people went to shows 
in that period that I was talking about, you know, in the early 90s, all kinds of people from all different uh, scenes were going to the same shows, you know, uh, I mean, not to make it about me, but just to use the example, like, uh, I noticed very early when I was doing shows with the Vanamar Quartet that all the shows were at Hot House when it was in Wicker Park, which was like the epicenter of all of the artists and musicians. A lot of them were all in that area. So there was a lot of uh, cross-pollination happening just because of that, of proximity. I mean, Chicago's a huge city. It's spread out all over the place. For a while, Wicker Park, everything was happening there. Wicker Park and like a lot of, a lot of clubs, rock clubs, musicians, artists, you know, it's cheap to be there affordable that's not true now so it doesn't exist <laughs> but but like i noticed so many rock people coming to our shows because i was going to rock shows and seeing the same people in the audience and i so i booked a show at lounge acts with fred anderson's band the vandermark quartet and energy ensemble um like i can't even remember like 1990 i don't know four or something like that i can't remember now but the place was packed I mean, literally packed with people. And it was all the people that would go to Lounge X to see a rock show, you know. And they were there, and they, they totally dug what we were doing. And I was like, okay, this makes sense. Put this music in front of that audience, and they, the, the, they will make the connections. So that's what we have to do. It's like, you know, like the thing, your, your invitation for me to come work with you is exactly that kind of thing where it's like we do that, and they will get it because it will speak for itself. You know, maybe very specifically to people who understand your music, mm -hmm. maybe very specifically people who understand my music, but even if they don't have those histories in their listening background, they will, the, the self-evident uh, synergy there will speak to them on whatever level they can receive it because that's how music works. I mean, I've seen people go to hear Paul Litton play. I did a show with Paul Litton and Ken Kessler in a bookstore, a free concert, and we thought it was going to be a catastrophe because... You know, the audience was like grandmothers and, and their grandchildren and, you know, people with their pets. I mean, it was like, you know, oh, man, this is – and they <laughs> loved it. They uh, – um, this is absolutely – Paul Lynn was like, oh, why are we going to do this? This is crazy. And it's like, well, you know, we got a fee for it. We're on tour. Let's just, you know, do what we can do. And it, it, I was stunned. I mean, we had people like 70-year-old grandmothers with their kid, you know, grandkids – coming up and say, that was the most amazing thing. I've never heard anything like that. And that's when I realized the music speaks for itself. You just right. got to get it in the room. You got to get it in front of people. And if it's good, then Paul Litton and Ken Kessler are amazing musicians playing at the top of their game. Everything's going to be fine. The hard part is getting them in the room. You know, and that's, that's part of our job. It's like me figuring out how to get people to come to my shows. And the same thing for, for you at Del Niente. How do you get the word out? Because, yeah, you have this core audience who love it. But for example, our core audiences should completely over. They should be the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that expands the audience because not everyone can come to every single show. And like that, that's part of our work is, you know, opening those doors up, making those connections by doing the work together. You know, right. not, you know, it's, it's gotta be more than like, well, this makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then we go off on our ways. Yes. It's like, we got, this makes sense. Let's make it happen. And that's why your invitation was so fantastic and why I'm excited that it's going to happen. It's just a little bit of a pause and I've been working on this Roscoe Mitchell piece still. So I'm ready. <laughs> we have, we, we have, we have two. Um, I've got a few messages <laughs> from my ensemble members being like, oh my God, this look at 140, <laughs> you're at 120, or whatever. Um, I feel it. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, I think this is, I mean, everything you just said is so, so interesting. And I, and I do feel like the, the funding question is also, I think you're really right to sort of point out that question as being a, a key one. And I think um, that's a good, um, I, I sort of think sometimes, uh, you know, musicians, you know, since it's such an insecure you know, financially insecure field that like sometimes musicians have a kind of zero sum game approach where they're like, they don't want to give any little piece of an audience to someone else, someone else. Mm -hmm. But I really think the philosophy should be the opposite, which is that like, it's not a zero sum game. There's a lot of people in the world and a lot of people that want to go to shows and our job. And, and it really feels to me like, if anything, this is always what I do. So I'm just going to like do it. But like, I really feel like you, like I blame capitalism for like creating genres, you know, whereas like, I mean, we can, you know, we got the free jazz section of the record store and the new music section of the record store. And like, that's a way for them to try to sell you records. But like, 
genre is useful, I think, in one sense, but it also in another sense, it's a real hindrance, right? It really gets in the yeah. way of like like-minded people collaborating. So I don't know. I mean, do you have thoughts about, I mean, just genre in, in general? Is that a thing you think about or don't care about or? Um, um, yeah, I think about it. I think, I think to your point, uh, categories and, and genres, you know, uh, can be a real trap uh, creatively, but also like in terms of like getting your work out to people on all kinds of levels. The, the tricky part is, you know, we're working in a field that's fairly abstract, well, very abstract, let's just be straight yeah. up about it. It's, it's abstract. Yeah. Yeah. And being able to talk about it with words, um, you know, means you've got to have a language for it. And, and that's, a, that's a real challenge. Like, I, I feel for as many arguments as I've had with journalists, uh, you know, I feel for their role in this. It's very hard to talk about music in clear right. ways, um, just as it's hard to write about art. You know, great, people would do a great job writing about art. I mean, that's an accomplishment. Uh, we need people to be able to articulate this stuff because I don't have time to do it. <laughs> I'm just <working laughs> on something else, you know. But to try to talk about work, you know, like like just our discussion about, you know, your field and my field, so to speak, new music field versus improvised music field, when we start, we need those terms in a way to actually have that conversation because we need sure. to have a sense of what is the subject. And to have a subject, you've got to have terminology. And the problem is the terminology really stinks. It's not good. And, and people, like I think Anthony Braxton's terminology for, the, for music is phenomenal. Like once you understand it, it's very clear, it's specific, it describes the thing, you know, the term describes the subject really well. And the conversation can be very clear. Unfortunately, not everybody knows that terminology. So it's right. not really useful. Not everyone's going to read Forces in Motion to get a handle on, on Braxton's lexicon, uh, which is too bad because it's a great book and, it's, and he's amazing. Mm -hmm. And Braxton's work inspires me maybe more than anything else. He's, I'm in awe of Braxton. But like to be able We're to- here talk, first. <laughs> <laughs> But, I, mean, but, I, I mean, I mean, for what it's worth, I agree. I mean, I find, yeah. Well, we, we have, we've actually tried to play. How do we talk about it? So it ends up becoming genre based in a way, it's just so we can say, okay, well, what's rock music? You know, what's classical music? And the thing is that that's, that's, well, that's a whole nother topic. I'll leave that alone. But I mean, we, we do have the struggle of, okay, how do we have a conversation without putting everybody in a box? Right. You know, and, um, the thing about capitalism, one of the really horrible things about it is people determine self-worth based on value, dollar value. Right. And if an art form makes more money, it, and many people, like let's be straight up about it, people think it's more significant. Yes. If it gets more funding, therefore it's better if they don't know any more about it. Like, you know, so someone like it, just put it, this is a weird example maybe, but you have someone like Madonna in her early career, very controversial. She tried, you know, remain controversial for years afterwards. It was a very good marketing uh, thing on one hand, but she was also opening up a lot on the other hand. Very, you know, like, and, and her, her use of Catholic imagery and her open, open, uh, uh, her openness about uh, her sexuality, all these kinds of things, very, very controversial. People outraged by her presence in the, in the universe. She became very, very wealthy. And as soon as that happened, as soon as she started selling lots and lots of records, the controversy remained, but she was totally accepted. Every, she's on the cover of Us magazine. You know, you, I mean, it, she's part of the universe and accepted for it. If she had not made any money, not only would like we not be talking about her right now, but all the things that were controversial would be the only thing in the conversation at all, if there was one. Money talks, and we live in a capitalist world. It speaks to everybody. So if contemporary art is selling for $2 million, people who don't know about art look at it and they go, well, it must be, it must be important. Even if they don't know about it, even if they don't like it, you know, it's significant because of its dollar value or its Euro value or its yen value. 
And, uh, you know, if uh, one kind of music is, is celebrated economically over another one, the message there isn't just about the money. It's about value of the work. Right. So people who don't get funding or their funding pool is very, very small, um, that their sense of self-worth can be impacted by that. And certainly the perspective on their worth artistically can be impacted on that. So it turns into like a very problematic uh, discourse. Kind of self-reinforcing cycle also. Yeah, exactly, where, you know. exactly. And it is connected to, to capitalism, to your point. And so you're in a situation where uh, if I hear the word brand one more time, I'm going to probably put my head through a wall. Oh but, you know, the idea of marketing and branding of genres, of categories to sell. Um, I understand how important it is to try to promote a show. I do it all the time. That's why I am on social media. I hate social media. <laughs> I like get on there and try to talk about something that makes sense to me, uh, talk about work I like whether it's mine or not, and I, I get off. But I understand that it has a significant way to reach people and it has an importance, so I do it. So promotion, since day one, I saw that as part of my job because no one was gonna do that for me. There isn't enough money there for someone to wanna do that for me. So that's been part of my job description forever. So I understand all those things and that marketing is part of that, but when that becomes in front, the precedent, over the work, the music, the art, then something is really screwed up. And it's very easy for that thing to become inverted. So the brand, to use the word I hate so much, but it makes sense in this, in this context, the brand is the thing and there's nothing behind that brand. There's nothing there, it's hollow. Yeah. And so I, I, it sets up a lot of problematic uh, uh, things in motion. And I think when, speaking personally, I always check myself on this because I think that, that, that there, I believe that there's an artistic compass in everybody um, that, that, are, that are working creatively in whatever field it might be. I know what I need to do, what I need to do uh, creatively. I know when I fail. I know when it feels successful. And people may or may not agree with me and I may be wrong, but I know. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And if, if I lose sight of that, I lose the hold on that compass, I am done because you can't get it back. It breaks, magnetic north goes east, you forget it. Because then you're constantly, well, I'm questioning, I'm questioning. And you look at these amazing artists, amazing filmmakers and, and musicians, whatever field you want to talk about, and their work is so fantastic. And then someone tells them they're a genius. Right, right. And you see it. You see it happen. You hear it happen. This inventiveness, this, this innovation, this super personal, unique universe, it erodes really fast because everything they do is genius. Genius. And they start working with sycophants and all this kind of stuff and the work tanks or becomes really boring or just mediocre or more of the same as everything else you've seen. And that to me is a signal like they lost something. Yeah. Because if you, you hold on to that, and someone says, You're, oh, it's so fantastic. You go, no, it's not. This is a complete catastrophe. We have to figure out how to fix this. You know? If it, and so I, I love working with people that are constantly challenging it because it helps reinforce the fact I've got I've to keep asking questions. Right. The better the questions are to me and to the work, the better the work is going to be. And if I ever let go of that and start thinking, oh, I can just do this, or I can show up and, and be Ken Vandermark, whatever that might be to somebody, there's a huge problem there. So I, I think that this, this, this set of problems involved with marketing, involved with a capitalist approach to selling things. I mean, I understand that getting the word out is gonna help people come to my concerts or to your concerts. It's totally necessary, but it has to be in proportion in relation to what is really the thing. And I know for you and your ensemble, the ensemble the people you work with in the ensemble and otherwise, that's got it, that's the priority. Yeah. Because then you figure out what work you need to do. If you don't know that anymore, you can't even figure out which way to go. And, and the compass is broken. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I, I'd be inter interested in knowing like along, along these lines, um, 
whether uh, I mean you work so much in Europe with with European musicians, and obviously they have a different funding model for well, at least for like in in sort of classical music world, there's a different funding model. I mean, artists are just much more well funded. Um, is it is it the same with the musicians that you work with there? I mean, does does the differences in like how European arts funding works impact their work there and how you work with them and how audiences receive them? Or do you find that different in Europe than in the U.S.? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, the arts in in the not, U.S. Not to be like anti-U.S. or anything, just like because oh, we've, no, we've got good stuff. Totally too. okay with me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, okay, a little bit anti-U.S. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, the reality is the arts. It doesn't matter which kind uh, in the United States uh, are a footnote unless they're profitable on a, on a huge scale, you know, um, that's historically been the way it's been, you know? Um, and, uh, you look at like David Tudor is one of my favorite musicians and you look at the people he worked with and the early part of his career was probably very economically difficult for him. And he was committed and remained that way his entire life to the work and making amazing things as a pianist and then as a, as a electronics musician. Um, I mean, and he's considered one of the great musicians of the 20th century. I mean, uh, as a performer and composer and whatnot. So that's just one random example. I mean, it, it, it in the States, it's going to be on the background. It's, it's just going to live there forever. I mean, it's to keep it to Europe. There's a history there of the art being part of the culture, right. being significant, like food. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you go to Spain and that friend, you know, you have the food, you have the, the wine and, and alcohol. You know, the, the amazing things they make there, and they have their art and their music, and that's part of who they are. You know, and that's different here, yeah. and it's changing. I think. I think there are definite changes. I mean. You know, food has become way more important in the last decade. And that sounds maybe not so important, but it is because that's a social connection people have. There's a pride and creativity in it, and there's significance there. And I think other cultures have understood that very well. I mean, you know, speaking of Japan, which you mentioned earlier, you go to Japan, there's a deep culture there. And it involves food, it involves music, it involves calligraphy. I mean, it's deep, you know, and that's part of who they are. And anybody who lives there has a connection to all of those levels of, of experience, you know? Um, so that changes the way it's perceived culturally and it, it, and it alters the way it gets supported economically. And in general, until recently, um, you know, in the last 10 years, it's changed pretty significantly and continues to do so because more and more countries have adopted the uh, American model of economics and they are, you know, trying to change taxes and this and that and the other thing. And less and less money is going to the arts. And that's, that's just a fact. So more and more musicians are in the position of people in the States who work creatively. They have less support than they used to. But generally speaking, cities would have, would have city money that could go towards funding music, just to keep it to music, to concerts that I would do. Then the state within that country, you know, different regions, depending on how they would break it up, they also had money. So the city in that region... There's two levels, and then there would be the country funding. The federal government, right. You know, so you have like three levels of funding for even the music I play, which is pretty peripheral. You know, so established cultural music, like in Vienna with the, with the symphony or the opera, they get a lot of money from the Austrian mm-hmm. government, citywide, you know, region, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a big difference. Um, you know, I've benefited a lot from the Norwegian support systems for uh, jazz and improvised music with my work with Paul. You know, I've had tours, the travel costs, accommodation costs completely paid for by the Norwegian government because he's in the group and he's able, he has, has been able to sometimes access that funding. That certainly does not exist here. I think just, it's amazing. I mean, I think like American musicians, like when you tell them things like that, they're like, how is that even like, it doesn't even occur to them that that could be a thing in the world, but it is. Right. It is. And, and it depends on, on the, on the, the country. I mean, there, you know, uh, I have really good friends uh, in Austria and, and um, talked to one of them, Christoph Kurtzman a few days ago. And we're talking about the circumstances and how hard everyone's being hit economically. You know, musicians who survive playing concerts, losing their livelihood for months, you know, maybe a year, you know, it's hard to say. And in Austria, and, it, and, and he's very anti-establishment, um, 
uh, he said he was really amazed by the response of the Austrian government, both to the virus, how quickly they clamped down and got people to quarantine. And like, you know, you can see it in the, in the infectious rate and death rate in Austria compared to other countries in Europe. In addition to that, to keep it to the arts part, musicians and artists, filmmakers, any work that they lost, they're being compensated for that in full now wow. by the government. So all the concerts that Christoph lost because of that, he's reported that and he's getting that income from the government without having to prove beforehand what that would have been, get letters from the presenters, get invoices and all that stuff. He's just saying, this is what it would have been. And they're like, take this money, you need it now. And then after this process, this, this whole crisis has, has passed, on the other side of it, they will follow up and say, okay, we need to know where that money was gonna go and blah, blah, blah. And then they'll deal with like the bureaucracy. But the fact that the government just stepped in and said, you have to have this relief now to artists. Yeah. That says a lot about the difference. I mean, our government isn't even taking care of like day-to-day -day people. From regular old people, yeah, anyone. You know, and forget artists, you know. And, and, and to be fair, there's been amazing things happening. You know, there's been shifts in grant money to go towards COVID relief immediately. There's been amazing arts things going on. I'm just talking like in the big, 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 big yep. picture. Arts funding in this country is almost an afterthought mm. in general, you know. I mean, I think like the, yeah, the, 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 the negative thing, of course, about living in the U.S. during COVID-19 is that, yeah, the, the government is totally dropping the ball. But, uh, you know, the, the silver lining, you know, and it's it's a small one, but it's a significant one, is that it does, artists really have tried to come together to support yeah. each other. I mean, it really, it's it's been really, like, I think just really inspiring, like, actually inspiring to see, like, so many artists trying to, like, give what they can give to support the artists that need it. And, like, if, you know... Um, who knows what that's going to mean for the future, but if it means that like our, our general music field needs to like have a conversation about how we're all going to like make it work, you know, financially um, going forward, I think like this is a good start. I agree with you completely. And I think that, that um, the people we know, I mean, one uh, totally inspiring, amazing, all the different things that are happening. Amazing. On one level, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Because the people that we work with are problem solvers. If you don't have funding to get something done, you find a way to do it anyway, and you find those funds, or you do it on a shoestring or whatever. Same thing creatively, the kind of music you make, the people you work with, the choices you, you know, how you challenge yourself. These are all people, I mean, everybody I work with is like that. They inspire me continually, even before this insanity, uh, so now when it's like the, the stakes are really high and things are really, really desperate for lots of people, they are completely stepping up and meeting that challenge because that's the way they are. That's just the way they think. They're wired that way. So on one level, it's like I'm not surprised. On the other hand, I am totally inspired and yeah. amazed and, and it, it just makes me want to do more and more and more. Um, and I think, what, you know, there's, a, there's terrible things going on. It's a terrible time. There's amazing things going on too. And, and I try to focus on that so I don't get overwhelmed by the neg negative news that's happening and the, and the tragedy that's happening and try to pay attention to the great things that are happening. And I am very excited to see on the other side of this, when the dust clears and we get back to some kind of normalcy again and concerts are possible again and the social creative things are in synergy again, um, how much comes out of this period yeah. pushes things forward in great ways. Because what gets learned here with the people that I know, it's going to be learned permanently and will be embraced going forward into situations where the necessity of having to only do online performances and et cetera, what gets learned in that will go forward to figure out, okay, uh, conversations like this talks about how do we get better resources for everybody. Let's even yeah. the playing field for everybody. Let's get more things to happen. Let's not maybe have zero sum gain in the arts, at least, you know, because more creativity is better, you know. And, and uh, I think that this kind of stuff is going to come out of this period as a positive, as an important development in the future of all the things that we're involved in. And uh, that is very exciting. 
and in a dark period to have those things like in there too, the opportunities that people are making for themselves and for each other is glorious. Thank you. This is a, uh, you, you're like, oh, I'm getting more out of this interview, I think, than like. You than, need. <laughs> yeah, no, this, no, this is great. This is, this is exactly, this is, I mean, I, I'm like more spiritually than I was like expecting to talk about like cool music stuff, but I wasn't like, oh, Ken Vandermark is going to like give me hope for the world. <laughs> well, you know, we take it, we take it a piece at a time, you yeah. know, I mean, that's the thing. It, 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 even outside of a context that is so extreme like this, we're told all the time we can't do it. You know, like people who work on, on the periphery, you know, whatever field it is, you know, there's no room for it. There's no interest. There's no this, there's no that. You're, you're constantly getting hammered with a, a negative response to, to who you are and what you do if you are different and not status quo. Yeah. Let's just keep it to arts. You know, the arts are different. And I think that um, what, what we see in, in, in people doing things for themselves, that action, every time a person does something individual, it's a contribution. Every time someone contributes something, even if it's small, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a gift, you know? And it's really easy. I mean, like now, I look at the news in the morning and that's it for the day. Every morning, it's like you're getting hit with like, a, I, you. I mean, it, and, and yes, I need to know what's going on, you know? Uh, my partner, Ellen, she's, she's a pediatrician and she's working at the hospital. It's intense right now, you know, and she's keeping safe and she's an amazing person and she's in there right at the front of this thing. Um, and that's amazing to be around. Like that inspires me. Like, wow. Like puts it in perspective. I'm a privileged person to pursue the path I'm on to play music. Even in this time, I am very fortunate. So every time I see something like a contribution happening, I jump on that. I run with it because those are the things that can keep us going, especially in a period this bad. And, uh, and I, 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 I want to cherish those things as they're happening because it's too easy to get caught up and told and, and start to believe that you can't do it. You know, yeah. we can. And this is an indicator. What's happening right now, the things you're seeing, the things I'm seeing in our universe, the creative universe. I mean, we're not waiting to hopefully get right. some friggin' handout from right. from the administration in power, screw it. <laughs> you know, we got to do it now. Yeah. We have to do it for each other now, and that's exactly what's happening. Over and over again, you're seeing different uh, uh, different aspects of that. People helping each other out, and I believe, as you mentioned, that this is going to go forward. Yeah. Where people are going to see this is how you do it on a global scale, like people helping each other out in this field. They're going to carry that forward because it makes it better. Sharing resources, sharing information, sharing context, collaborating, building bridges, opening up doors. That energy comes back tenfold. And I, I'm speaking firsthand. I, I've had that experience underscored over and over and over and over again in my life. And, and this is a time where it just indicates it on a huge stage even more than before. It's like, you know, Ken Vandermark for president, Ken Vandermark 2020. That's what, that's <laughs> no what we need. That's way. What we need. Um, <laughs> I do, before we, um, this is great. I mean, uh, before we wrap up, I mean, I did, I did want to just at least maybe like, maybe we'll play some of this piece, like as, as the, you know, we'll edit it in later, but um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I, I want, I didn't want to like ask you about, uh, you know, some of your music, which is like, uh, which, which I bet some of our audience will, will know some of, but like your discography is so huge and this, um, this partic particular composition that I had not, that I didn't know until you, you mentioned it to me, um, Soigné Ta Droite. Um, is there a particular section you would like us to play from it? Um, and would, would you like to say a couple of things about it? I'm just, I mean, it's a fascinating composition. I mean, speaking of experiments with form and like experiments with timbre and balance, I mean, I'd just be curious to know any thoughts you have about this piece or your process or... Well, which one is it? Because there's there's three pieces on the record. Right, exactly. There's the there's perpetual desk, there's foundry, and there's telegram. Um, any of those three that you would like to to speak about? I'd be interested. Or um, wow. And I can, well, I can play. I the second piece. The second piece. It starts off with with Nate Woolley mm -hmm. solo, uh, amplified trumpet. 
Yeah, let me see. Nate, I, I, Nate's, a, Nate's a great example of this cross pollination uh, boundary, uh, racing boundaries. Um, Sorry, that's the is that the right one? Yeah, it starts uh, starts with just the trumpet. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's just hear a little bit of this. That's Nate singing. Trumpet, amplified. And it's a perfect example of this cross boundary thing. He uh, he works with music. Works with Eliana D. We just performed in Chicago in uh, February. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, basically, I, I guess I picked this because it starts from a solo standpoint. And what Nate did there, we had rehearsed all week. Uh, I love writing for large ensembles, and this group is really exciting for me. We got to do a, uh, a residency in Krakow in October and did a bunch of concerts, and yeah, a great group of people, amazing people. And, and Nate, you know, we had been rehearsing it and, you know, writing the piece and going over the parts, and we had done like kind of a dress rehearsal the day before, and it started with the solo thing, and I wanted him to use the amplified trumpet because what he does with it is completely amazing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And, it, and he came out, uh, and it was just, you know, like a sold out concert at a festival in St. Johan, the Art X Festival in March of 2018. And he came out uh, to start and I just expected, you know, what I had heard, you know, in the parameters of what he does with that, that instrumentation uh, to come in maybe real hard because it's, a, you know, there's a lot of energy and he came out and he was singing. I was like, so, because I was standing next to him in the, in the formation. And he just, it was like so intimate and surprising. It's this guy up in front, like singing at the trumpet so the, the pickup on it, could, so that it has this kind of unusual sound. And then he brought his face to the mouthpiece and then transformed it. It's, it's insane. The solo is unbelievable. And it builds out from there, adding elements of the orchestra and going through a series of combinations of, of players and written passages and whatever. Um, I mean, I picked that because it starts small and gets very, very big and very, very dense. The, the thing about large ensembles is, uh, as much as I like writing for any kind of group and the, the interaction between co composed elements and improvised elements, that's really my my thing. That's my interest, which leads to interest in changing forms and, and whatnot. Um, the thing with a large ensemble is, uh, you know, I think there's 10 people in the group. Christoph Kurtzman joined in, in October, made it 11. There are forces. There's like physical mass in sound. And I got to be honest, there's something really great going to that. Yeah. When, you, when you have also the, the, the colors involved, you know, in the horn section, Metro Rasmus is playing alto, Nate, myself playing clarinet and tenor. There's piano, the turntables, now Christoph's laptop, two drummers, uh, electric bass, and uh, two electric guitar players, upright bass, electric bass. Um, and I think that's everything. Um, I mean, there's so many forces there to work with. And you can go from complete density to this example with Nate solo, but even with the solo thing, as you hear the piece develop and that solo develop, that's an orchestra onto itself. What Nate creates, it's like, holy crap. So that, I love working with that. And, and you know, the construction part, I, I get more out of film um, than, than, than music. I mean, I listen to music all the time I, I study it and research it all the time. But in terms of like making things, I think I'm too close to it and I love cinema. And cinema is far enough a field where I look at the way my favorite filmmakers work visually in terms of constructing things. And that talks to me about what I need to do structurally and how to make things differently. And you know, very early uh, with the Vandermark Five, I moved towards a more narrative, linear compositional approach 
and methodology because I, it's like, you know, a film starts and doesn't come back to that moment. <laughs> it evolves over a series of, of, let's say, episodes and chapters and whatnot. And how a filmmaker maintains tension through a period of 90 minutes or three hours or whatever it might be, that helps me deal with form uh, more than musical examples just because my brain works visually. I mean, I'm a musician, but my thinking process is, is, is constructs things visually. So when I think of activity and music, to make it simple, it's like this is a block, this activity. So like mm -hmm. Nate's solo is a block. Uh -huh. And then uh, the drummer, D.D. Kern, joins him. That's another block. And I'm building something with these blocks. And I think about it that way. I don't think about, well, okay, uh, you know, the, the, the percussion indicates this kind of thing and I should use mm. more percussion. I mean, I don't think that way. It's like activity. It's gesture and activity. And, yeah. and that makes it possible for me to look at cinema as a source, a resource for thinking about different shapes and different organization. And there's so many amazing filmmakers. And when you, when you remove mm, the, the narrative content, like let's say if it's narrative film storyline, and you look at just the construction, like the great filmmakers, they're working on that level anyway. You know, they're just like, I mean, Orson Welles or Godard. I mean, what I, I cite this a lot because it's maybe an easy example, but the beginning of my favorite Godard film, which is Viva Savi, um, it starts off with the credits, uh, Anna Karina's looking at the camera. The uh, credits are coming, you know, being printed. And there's this really beautiful snippet of music by uh, Michelle Legrand. And it cuts and shoots from one side of her face. She's in profile. And the, it's, it's so great. I mean, because it, again, it comes back to the raw thing. Mm. It's, it's, it's like the sound design is really raw. It sounds like almost when the music comes back in, like he's dropped a needle on a record. Mm. It's, just cut. it's like cut rough. It's not like this beautiful smooth entrance the cut is pretty sharp too suddenly it's the side of her face whoa that's jarring more credits and and she's the the thing that she's doing looking at the camera oh she blinks again oh it's the same shot he shot it from a different direction too at the same time Poof, cuts again to the other other profile again with the music it's all the same components mm -hmm. and then the first time I, I saw it i realized that's not the same shot she's it's the same things, but she doesn't do them exactly in the same order. She looks at her lips, she blinks. Mm. And I said, holy crap, holy crap. And then it goes to the first scene and she's sitting at a bar shot from the back, which at the time is super radical because you never started a film not showing the star. You, know, you, just, you can't see her face. She's looking at the bar, it's a cafe, there's a guy making coffee or something and she's talking. And you assume she's talking to the, the, the bartender. And then the person next to her starts talking to her and, he, and she's been talking to him, but she's been looking for the whole film is displacement of intention, of attention, mm -hmm. uh, of attention, of, of what you hear, what you see. The entire film, I was like almost not sitting down because over and over and over again, he makes you look, you have to pay attention. The thing you think you're seeing is not really the thing you see. And it, it, that, principle alone had more impact in the way I think about organizing music than music because it's like I have to do that I want to create pieces where people never know what's going to happen next but not lose them because if you do it too much it's like they you, they tune out like I, I it's always going to change I already figured out how to make it change make you think you know what's happening and realize you don't to 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 tune in harder. I mean, this is an amazing scene in it where she's watching uh, the Passion of Joan of Arc, the Dreyer film in the theater, silent film, and he turns the sound off. There's no, no, the, uh, the diegetic sound's gone, mm. the soundtrack's gone. Mm. You look at Anna Karina watching that incredible performance. She's weeping. Anna Karina begins to weep and you're in a silent room, so to speak. Mm. And you don't even know that it's happened at first because you're so captivated by right. the flow. So that, that whole dynamic of flow and, and displacement, that is like, if I have a methodology, that's the one I want to explore.
you know, right. like, how do you do that? How do you do that? And you know, there's, there's memory in music. How do you displace memory? How do you work with that? How do you imply like bringing, I mean, it's all basic music stuff. Like, you know, uh, theme and variations, introductions, you know, transitions. But when I think about it in terms of, of visual work, like film work, it pulls me out of like, okay, these are the conventions. You know, like this is how you do a development. Well, you don't have to do a development that way. Or maybe it ends up being the way you do it, but by thinking outside of that musical line and looking over here to see something different, it, it triggers another way of organization that for me has been really useful. Uh, it's, I mean, it's really remarkable to hear you say that, like, because, you know, uh, I mean, you'll be happy to hear this. I mean, in the last, you know, day or two, as I've been trying to, like, think about, you know, how I want to, like, approach this interview and how, how I want to, like, talk about your music, the thing that I keep thinking is something like, you know, this is music, your music, that, like, somehow, like, demands to be listened to. It like and it almost like tells you how to listen to it. It's like it forces you to listen. It's not music that you know. In fact, when, like when I've tried to have your music on and writing emails or something like, like that, I like I I can't do that because like your music <laughs> is too distracting. Well, that's a very yeah. high compliment. It's a, yeah, it's meant it's meant to be one. I mean, it's you know because it, it really does feel <laughs> like you know my music is too distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, um, thank you very much. That's, you can that's, put that on. Your, that can be your poll quote, you know. <laughs> website, you know. Um, but 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 seriously, it is like that's exactly like this notion that you're talking about of like, you know, attention and like forcing the viewer in this in this film to to, to pay attention to all these changes. And um, that's exactly what I think when I hear your music is that it it does really force me to. It, it doesn't let me do anything else. It may it forces me to stay in the moment and sort of maybe think a little ahead and a little behind, but really like. It it, it 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 grabs my attention and it forces me to have expectations that are then played with or something interesting like that. But it does like, it, it, it just gets in your face and doesn't let you write emails. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's really great to hear because that, that's kind of, that's kind of where I want to be. I want to, I want to try to find a way to make someone listen, you know, like without, without like, being didactic about it, but like make them listen just because they have to listen, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and pull them in and then manipulate these components in a way that, that the tension never stops, even if it's, you know, slow moving. Like, I mean, I'm no Eliane Radig, but seeing her music live for the first time when they performed, I mean, it's narrative. I was really shocked by that. I mean, the, the, the motion, it maybe is, is slow, it surface maybe appears static, but there's a narrative there. And that actually told me a lot. I mean, to, go, to con contradict myself, that was a musical thing that told me a lot about myself. When I saw that performance of Nate's, and hearing it live was key. Like, I've listened to recordings right. of Nate's music, but hearing it live, I realized the reason I liked it so much was that it was narrative. There was a, a point A to whatever... B, C, D, whatever. And on the surface, maybe you feel like you're in A a long time. But in reality, you're moving. It's bringing you somewhere. That music was bringing me on a narrative course. And that's what I need in, in music. I, I, there's, there's other kinds of music, and, and not to say that they're not equally valuable or worthwhile, but I, I realized something about myself, which also connects to cinema. And by narrative, I don't mean like conventional storyline, but that the, the music brings you from a point to another point that it's it's uh you cannot look away from it you can't stop right. listening because it's organically bringing you you know and in many cases of my music it's up the role of the improviser is to help bring us both the musicians and the listeners to the next point the next compositional element or reflect on that material and push it somewhere else but there's always movement you're always going forward and and because it's a time-based performance art that one of the big issues to me is how do you deal with time like chronological time how do you mess with time and that is connected to memory and bringing elements in early how do they feel 20 minutes later in a different context or just revealing something at the end 
uh, that was never there before. Is it possible to do that and not have it feel just like uh, an added uh, uh, unintentional, uninteresting point, you know? I mean, it's, it's these things, I mean, to again contradict myself, I think about the theatrical, uh, theatricality, and you mentioned it earlier, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. When I think about that, that piece, when it was first performed, like no one knew what was gonna happen. He had this chorus on stage for a really long time. <laughs> And I, I just, and it's still now when you hear the, that come in, it's like, oh my God, it is so impossibly great. Yeah. You know? And then you think of like, you were at one of the first performances where before you could talk about that stuff and like, now it would be like on, you know, on Instagram in two seconds or YouTube, you know, but like at that time and you're in the audience, and like that chorus is standing there for like, I don't know, what is it? Almost yeah, 45 hour? minutes, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And what's going to happen? Like, you talk about fear. Like, he knew what he was doing. Like, yeah. waiting, waiting. Talk about tension. And then he delivers on it. It's not like, oh, you got to be kidding. That's the end. Like, I, <laughs> like, wow. Like, if you're going to do that, you have got some, man, yeah. you've got some shots and some guts. Like, you, you're, the payoff on that is more than you can imagine. Even now, hearing it many, 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 many times. It's one of my, my favorite things in music, that that experience of that voice. And that, I mean, wow. And so that construction, like, wow. Like, I mean, that's something you can steal. But can you do it? <laughs> right, right, right. Like, can you do it? And so to reverse that, Nate, at the front end of this piece that I was talking about, that's like, for me, is an improvised Beethoven moment. Like, I didn't know he was gonna start with the voice. I was standing there, I was like, what? And like, we're in this big concert hall, and he's just one guy alone yelling out into the room, basically. And I got chills, like I got chills now, honestly. Like, on my bed, wow! Talk about risk, you know, artistic, creative, like, okay, he's got a whole band on stage. And he's doing what? Like, he's we a trumpet like, player and he's singing. <laughs> Yeah, like, like what? And he'll vocalize stuff sometimes and whatnot. But like, I just to have him up on that stage yelling out in the room or singing out of that, that's like, what? I could never, I never would have imagined that. I never would have scripted that. In the part, the block I gave him, open solo, amplified trumpet. And then D.D. Kern joins here. You can do anything with it. And he did that. The most amazing thing I could never have thought of. And that's what's great about working with improvisers like that and working with composition. He knew what was coming next. He knew that the whole ensemble was going to come in as this hyper-dense kind of anthem-like construction. He knew where it was going. Give me the ball. I'm going to kill this. Mm. And, man, did he ever. I mean, wow. So, so it's, it's like that kind of excitement, like that, that risk, the raw character of it, the jump to something I didn't know he was going to do. It's like that thing at the end of the ninth. What are they going to do? They're standing there. Nate's standing there. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? He's going to do that? It's like even better because I didn't know what it would be. Like if I was an orchestra, I would know that the chorus is going to come in. It's going to be amazing and incredible. But like Nate just blew my socks off by doing something I could never have guessed. That's the beauty of the, of the improviser. Wow. I can, um, we should probably, um, Wrap, you know, wrap gotta, up. I, 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 once I start talking, I'll just talk forever. I, I, I gotta go because I, I have a meeting. Because you've got a meeting too. I, I, but Ken, Ken Vandermark, I do. I, I want to say one more thing. Um, maybe the most important detail about you that, that we haven't mentioned that um, yet, yet, which is that your birthday is September twenty second, which is the day after mine. Oh wow! Um, mine's the twenty first, so it's, it's always great. It's like it's really a, a, a genuine pleasure to talk to a fellow Virgo, um, <laughs> and. Uh, and especially like such an erudite and like great musician Virgo, um, it's really like a, an absolute pleasure to, to 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 interact with you and talk. And um, we, we will we will perform the Roscoe Mitchell piece, um, you know, sooner hopefully uh, sooner hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, mm -hmm. But a tiny little silver lining is that at least we had this time to to get to talk about art. Um, and you know, otherwise, you know, otherwise we're both so busy that who knows when we would have found, you know, an hour and a half to do so. And like, just getting, he hearing you talk about art um, has been like truly inspiring. And so I really want to thank you for, for joining me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been really a pleasure. And thank you for asking me. And I'm looking forward to the, 
the time working with you guys. I, I can't wait. It's going to be fantastic. Fabulous. Um, uh, uh, Igor, do you need anything else from us? You want to just unmute yourself or like?